Welcome to Front and Center, from the political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. That's what we're all about. And we have an incredible guest today that we'd like to introduce you to, Bobby Austin. I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, Steve Behrman. And Steve, would you introduce Bobby for us? Great, thank you and hello everybody. Uh, our guest today is uh, Bobby Austin. He's the president and CEO of Neighborhood Associates. Uh, he is um, involved in something that's called uh, public kinship. And I first met Bobby about uh, almost a year ago through a mutual associate, Norlin Dimmitt. And what got me very, very interested is Norlin talking about how many faith-based groups there are out there who are really looking to um, essentially create a beloved community to essentially look after people and, and you know follow the deepest spiritual teachings, uh, social activism to bring people together across the political divide. So I'm really, really pleased to have you here today for our conversation. Uh, welcome, Bobby. Thank you very much, uh, C. Thank you for having me and Michael. Well, first of all, let's just begin with, with this concept of uh, public kinship in, in your work over the past uh, a bunch of years. A, a little bit background on, on work your, what your work has been and where it's taken you uh, in recent months and years. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, public kinship is a concept that I, um, I came up with uh, many years ago, actually. I was just looking back for this program because I forget how long it's been sometimes. But in 92, 93, I think we came out with a book uh, at when I was at Kellogg called Repairing the Breach. And that book was uh, about um, how to reconnect uh, African-American men and boys to American society. And after all that we had talked about and we had some wonderful scholars and we had um, uh, activists and ministers and different people, educators, and to talk with us, um, as foundations can do, they can, one thing they can do well, if they do it, is to convene. And so we did convene um, some wonderful people. But after I was, as I was trying to put the piece together, I didn't see a, like a real glue, repairing the breach, yes, yes, all those things, it, it worked, that was right, it had to be internal review and communities, each community needed to review itself and see what was wrong. And, and then they had to be external uh, work with the communities outside of you. Uh, but I thought about it and as I was writing, I said, you know, what we need is some kind of public concept where we can feel like, we can feel like family whether we are or not. It doesn't frighten people to think we're all gonna get married. Uh, you know, Americans can be very base, at times, and um, I mean, I'm from the South and I can remember the days where you would actually hear people on television say, would you want your daughter to marry one? Now, of course, as science has come around, it appears that not only uh, they married one, they married millions and they didn't actually marry them. They were just, they just cohabitated. That's part of how we are as a people in this society. But we don't recognize that yet and we don't see it yet, even though we see it every day as we look at ourselves and our friends around us. So I said, well, you know what? Maybe public kinship, which says we are publicly related and we're publicly related because we have an ethic which is Judeo-Christian, and that is do unto others as you would have those people do unto you. And basically that's how public kinship came about. It was a very simple mantra that I thought if we could all learn this, if our children could learn it, if adults could learn it, if politicians could learn it, and that is just treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, public kinship would be here, it would be something we could all do. It's all about self-assessment. It's about something I do. And it's not asking other people to do anything except assess themselves. And that's how it got started. So this is a purely voluntary notion that each of us from our own uh, spiritual understandings, let's say, um, we begin to be aware of and act as if we are all related. Of course, the native peoples would say all our relations including the entire web of life and, and the animal kingdom and so on. Um, so it's been almost 30 years, 1992. Yeah. So, so in that period of time, um, we, we can't condense it now, all of your lessons learned in the next five minutes, but 
what ha you know, how has this notion played out, let's say in ways that have been positively uh, surprising? And then um, what have been some of the obstacles uh, that you've run into? Well, it's very difficult uh, to tell you the truth, uh, mainly because people want, um, uh, I guess in America, I won't say people, but I think most Americans like things that come with instruction packets. So it's got to tell you step one, step two, step three, step four. I dare not try to think for myself outside of that because I might blow up the new um, cereal or whatever. So whenever you start talking about doing something, well, how do you do that? And I found that that question has gone on for years and I would say, well, can't you think of someone? No, no. How, how do you do public kinship? And eventually I said, well, you know, maybe I'm the one who's being pigheaded because I think I understand it. And I'm saying to people, it's just very simple. Uh, but, you know, it's been 2000 years since um, Christ tried to uh, get us to do unto others as we'd have them do unto ourselves as we, as we treat other people. It's so simple. And it looks like it is the simple things that we can't get to. That if I wish to be civil, if I wish to have um, a world in which I'm treated well, I will treat you well. Doesn't seem complicated to me. And yet it has been a complicated road that we have traveled. Now, I convinced Kellogg they liked it. We put a lot of money into it. We worked with young people groups across the country of about eight years, I guess, uh, particularly African-American men and boys. And that went pretty well. It's just that in some of these, some cases um, in our society, we think it's, it's for those people. It's not for me. If we could just get black boys to treat us well, the society already treats them well. Well, that's not true, but it's very difficult to get people to own up to what is the actual problem in America. And that's what the summer of last year was all about. It was about a reckoning of, if you don't believe it, here is a videotape that shows a man up with his knee in a man's neck until that man dies. And it is not a cartoon, it is not a movie, it is not a documentary. It is someone's life and you had to watch it in living color on your television set. I think that shocked Americans because they had to finally come to grips with, you see my friends, this is not a game. This is happening to people every day on the streets. Now, if that officer and I would say anyone, I'm not gonna pick on him, would have treated that fellow, Mr. Floyd, as he would have his nephew, he would not have done that. And you cannot convince me that he would have. If that had been someone of his kin group, or even of his ethnic group, he probably would not have done that. But because this was an other, a not us, a interloper, a whatever, I can sit here with my, neck, my knee on his neck while someone actually videotapes me. I think, you know, I hate to say that a man had to give his life for us to come to some reckoning about this. But see, that's public kinship in the negative. Public kinship is very simple. Now, mind you, I have done eight steps for <laughs> creating public kinship because we're trying to work on getting people to do this and eventually I will go through those. Uh, but I am saying at its essence, at its very, um, very quick. It is a very simple, um, uncomplicated idea. Treat people the way I want to be treated and it becomes public kinship. They become my public family. They become my, my family outside of my home. I can go outside of my door and I'm not afraid. I can walk down the street and because no one's going to harm me. How long is it going to take us to do that? A while. But I think if we start, if we start building a public philosophy um, around this kind of idea that we can in generations to come create a society that thinks this way. Bobby? You know, I, oh, here, go ahead, uh, Michael. 
Bobby, uh, wanted to ask you, you mentioned those eight steps to build mm -hmm. public kinship. Because mm -hmm. uh, I believe you've hit on something that's really important here, this concept of kinship, this concept of feeling connected, of being part of a family, of a relationship. It mm -hmm. dramatically changes as you unfortunately had to use that example, but mm -hmm. to give that example, uh, could you walk us through those eight steps briefly? Sure, if you don't mind me reading them, because if I were to try to do them by memory as I could have done five years ago, it would be a scramble. But uh, I did write these. <laughs> Today I have to put on my glasses and because I did them for someone. And when I was finished, one of my more, my younger staff person said, I think you were wrong. You know, I went, no, I was not wrong, <laughs> but what did I do? And I, I, I did, I got in the wrong place. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna go through them one through eight. The first one is um, what, what I call environmental scan and self-leadership, because this is all about self-leadership, leading yourself. Now, don't forget, I worked for years in a department under a wonderful, wonderful, woman, her uh, name was uh, Dr. Lorraine Matusek, a former uh, mother superior. And she, boy, she acted like it, even though she was out of the, <laughs> out of the habit, boy, she was- <laughs> Out of the habit. <laughs> <laughs> out of the habit. <laughs> Bad dog. <laughs> she, um, she, unfortunately, she passed last year. But Lorraine was one of those people who, if you had a good idea, she would run with you with it. I mean, and she'd fight anybody to get it done. And then, and I, she was my ally in getting this done. And it was like, it's self, how do you lead yourself to good action? I'm not gonna go through a lot, but that's the whole point. Could the officer had the ability to see where he was, see this group of people, look at his environment and then lead himself to good action. None of that would have occurred. It would have been a totally different thing and and i hate to do it in this way but it's the only way we can understand it in the young man mr ruth i believe his name was r-o-o-f in at mother bethel when he shot the, the people in prayer at their prayer meeting um when the cop policeman took him uh, to, to jail on the way they asked him if he uh, if he was hungry and um he said yes and so they bought him a hamburger before they took him uh, to jail. That is public kinship uh, because the policeman evidently looked at him as his son or his nephew or someone that he he could relate to. So he was worried if he, not that, not because he was worried if he killed them, but he certainly was worried if he were hungry. Uh, I may, I won't put a fine point on that. I'm stating it so you can see the balance between public kinship and non-kinship and how you treat people and how people are treated. So self-leadership is the first one, scanning that environment. Second is suspension of judgment, but not of common sense. Now, I actually got that from my, my daughters <laughs> because um, suspension of judgment simply means that, you know, you suspend all your, your ideas of what someone is horrible just by looking at them and, you know, and then you try to work something out. But don't lose your common sense means don't bring me anybody. Don't bring anybody home just because you're suspending judgment. Don't tell me what you told me. I could like anybody. Yeah, I did. But I didn't say you could like the first criminal you see walking down the street. That is not what I meant. So don't lose your common sense. And it's the same way with this. Don't, 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 don't go overboard. But the point is, you've got to suspend some judgment in order to say, okay, I don't know whether I like these people. But you're going to have to suspend that judgment for a while until you can figure out, have to even scan that environment to see what that's all about. So it's that relinquishing those previous ideas you may have had about a group of people. Um, third, ethics in the development of a moral mind. Now that sounds very highfalutin and yet it is not. Um, the mor a moral mind to me is that we all have a mind and a mindset and we all, we don't understand it. I've, I've been reading psychologists and psychiatrists for about 10 years, just trying to get a grip on the mind and the conscious and the subconscious. 
um, even though I know a lot of them don't like Freud. I, actually, I'm a social scientist, so I kind of like Freud in parts, but uh, uh, Jung, Jung is even better. But the point is the moral mind is creating a vocabulary that supports the development of moral action. So that, by that, I mean, if I am able to create in my mind, a mindset of doing good action and good, um, so I say, good work with people, I can, in my mind, create, if, you, if you've ever done, if you've ever done, for instance, when I first started doing my, my dissertation, I was trying to figure out, will I ever get this thing done? And I finally had to get into a zone where I created a language that said, I will finish this. No matter what, it may kill me. No matter how many times Dr. Broad sends me back with this sheet of paper, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go back. I'm not gonna cry like I did the first two times. I'm gonna go back and I'm going to give it to him. And he's gonna give it back to me and I'm gonna give it, take it. And in my mind, I was creating this, 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 uh, this engine of, I can do this. I will get this done and I will be finished. And when I finish, he said to me in the most, I guess it's the most New York way of saying things, hmm, good job, kid. And I'm like, that's all I get after three years of this. <laughs> good job, kid. <laughs> okay, well, I took it and ran because it was what I'm waiting for. But in my mind, I had to create my own moral engine for getting there because I could, you can't allow yourself become very angry. I know people quit, they stopped. They just couldn't take it, not because they were doing anything to them, but they kept feeling something was being done to them. A moral mind allows you to develop moral action for yourself. And that is very important in community. Then fourth is taking a stand on that moral action that you created in your mind. The two of you have created a moral action. You wouldn't be doing this if you hadn't. You could be doing many things. I don't know where you live, but you'd be fishing, you could be doing anything. But you have created a moral concept in your head of this is who I am, Michael. This is who I am, Steve. And when I leave here, this world, this is my epithet. You will know me by my work, by what I have done. And this is a moral epithet, a moral language. You took a stand and you took that stand by doing the things that you're doing now, taking out your time to help me to get my uh, computer set up so I wouldn't have a lot of glare. And it seems like a lot of strange little things that you're doing. But you see, I think sometimes we forget it is these strange little things that at the end of life add up to the big picture of who you were as a moral individual. Uh, I don't think that I know people who knew Dr. King and they said he was wonderful, but Dr. King didn't grow up thinking he was a moral leader. <laughs> he was a little boy who did things that all little boys, you know, did and his parents got after him. You know, he was, you know, he wasn't Reverend Dr. King every time you saw him at age 14, but he was building a moral life. And they would tell you this one, one woman who's a friend of mine said he was always a little different. And I think by that, she probably meant he was moral, but the family was like that as well. So he was being molded by that. Next is Bobby, participation. Bobby, yes. Bobby, you interrupted. I'd like to go back and stay on that point a little bit because mm -hmm. it's such a crucial point uh, that we are the sum of all of our mm -hmm. relations of all that have happened to us. That helps build us. And you use the term builds us. Mm -hmm. um, and the name of our show, Front and Center, is exactly purposeful because it's, the, it's time right now to take a stand. We need people mm -hmm. to stand up to have that yes. courage. But uh, it's up to them uh, to take those teachings uh, and do what they can. But it is about building, and you are the summation of all. And you could have quit on that doctoral instead yeah. of thinking of it. I was a victim of something, you know, you ended up saying, no, I was the little engine that could. That story that we grew up with, many of us, the little right. engine that could, is the attitude, the persistence that's necessary. Um, so thank well, you. I will tell you this, Michael. Dr. Broads told me after the first paper I gave him, where did you go to school? Now he knew exactly where I went to school because he had picked me out to come and study with him. And I went to a wonderful school. 
And then he said, where, he wanted to know where my elementary and secondary education was. And so I told him, and I won't give you the exact words. So you don't use bad words. He said, you ought to go ahead and sue those. So, so, but, so, <laughs> you know, that's the guy I told him at the time it was my girlfriend. I said, oh, I felt like dying. You know, here I put my best foot forward. And he said, you ought to go sue them. So because of what they have done to you. Oh, he corrected that in three years. But yeah, you're right. You know, it is, a man, and, and most nowadays, no one can take criticism. You can't criticize people about anything because you wind up in a lot of, a lot of trouble. But participating is key once you've done all of those things. That's what you guys are doing. Uh, you are participating now. And this requires good faith that you believe that what you have you are trying to do yourself, not other people. Because don't forget, this is, is the Mike and Steve show. It's what you're trying to do. It's what you want to do in getting people to participate. Then you, the, the fifth and sixth thing is then you are connecting. You're connecting with me, who you really don't know, but who you believe that if I connect with this guy, this might further what I'm trying to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is not selfish. It is, it is, you should be attempting to gain people not to prop, you know, missionary work or proselytizing, but that you are gaining ears of people to listen to what you are trying to say. And you do that through connecting and taking the steps to connect with other people. Then the last one is once you do that, you begin to assume a common culture. To me, the assumption of a or the common culture is the key to all of this. If we as Americans do not understand yet, and this is all Americans, black, white, purple, whatever you are, we do have different ethnic Cultures, obviously, ethnic groups have their own ways of doing things and their own cultures. But a huge society like our society, which is multifaceted, multiracial, and multicultural, has to have an overall common culture that we all can aspire to, can assert as ours and that is not, doesn't belong to this person or that person, but that I help to build that culture. And I work on that and I think that is one of the keys. If I can get people to say, no, 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 no. Yeah, you can have your, you're Jewish. Yeah, that's fine, that's your culture. I'm, 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 I'm a Kentuckian. I'm not actually, I'm not, black is not a culture, but I mean, you know, but there are uh, about 38 different um, uh, uh, African-American, uh, ethnic groups in this country. Uh, I'm West Indian, whatever I am, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican, I am Italian, uh, but I learned a very good lesson when I, when I was in, um, you know, life is a lesson. When I was in, in Canada, one of my roommates was one, was Chinese, but the other one was Italian. And so I was glibly talking one day, he said, no, 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 I'm Sicilian. <laughs> well, you know, for me, I had to, I had to, no, I'm from Kentucky, well, you know, we, Italian to us means Italian spaghetti. <laughs> <That's about all. laughs> it didn't mean anything else. <laughs> At that time, I didn't know Robert De Niro, who I love. But I mean, it was like my mother was saying, I think we're going to get some Italian spaghetti. And uh, we just thought that was just eating these strings was amazing. We could do this. And uh, so um, he said, no, uh, uh, we're, 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 uh, we're this is in Toronto. He said, we are uh, Sicilian. He had to explain to me. And then he made a funny joke. He said, well, if you ask an Italian, he would tell you, you know, Africa begins in Sicily. I said, oh, I get it. I get it. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> this makes sense to yeah. me. Yeah. So, so I'm, I, what I'm saying to you is that all of that is nice. All of that is real. But without a common culture, we will destroy the country. Now, I can tell you that without having to move. Uh, it won't be the Russians, it won't be the Chinese, it will be us. Because you've got to have some common bond which carries you through. Public kinship begins you on that process and should lead you to accepting 
I don't know what that common, I know what some pieces of that common culture are, we have it, but it has to be done. And that then leads to public kinship, that's number eight. So those are the eight pieces of it. Uh, some are very dictatorial, most are not. But the assumption of a common culture, uh, without that, I don't know where we go because, and I think we're getting further and further away from it. You know, uh, today, I mean, um, I, you know, I, I, I hold some strange ideas. I will not give those today because they, I don't know, so they may cut off your funding, but- um, <laughs> we have, We're not um, funded by anybody. We don't care. Oh, okay. so we have, <laughs> but you'll yeah, never we get have, any. We, we have no this. funding at all. We're, we're proud to say that. So uh, I'm, we're on I, free it, speech radio here. <laughs> so, and we're inviting, seriously, Bobby, we're inviting you to share your experience because we are in, as you would say, perhaps the most polarized and polarizing oh. time since the American Civil War. None of us were alive for that. Uh, and we're very interested in your, your most frank um, commentary um, uh, about this because part of this is really getting to a bigger sense of truth together. We just interviewed Randall Paul. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he's a, yeah, a religious uh, diplomacy. And mm -hmm. he talks about different uh, belief systems engaging with one another in a way where they fully share what they think, knowing that there's a heart connection between mm -hmm. the people, so that that's, that's enough to really hold the space to listen to ideas that may not be comfortable. So uh, we, we are, I'm inviting you and Michael is too, to, uh, to jump in because this is really the most vexing issue we seem to be facing right now. Right. No, no, no. I, I, I thank you so much for that. Well, I will only take, I'll take one of those uh, and um, try to, uh, the most vexing one I will not do yet, but um, it's the symbol, symbols in our society are the most vexing problems that we have because we all invest emotion in symbols no matter what those symbols are. And so whether it is a, in a flag, whether it is in a cross or a crescent moon, whatever the symbol is, we invest our emotion in it. Some people invest their lives in it, which means to me, they haven't developed a moral mind yet. They have invested in a concept that they think will lead them somewhere. Uh, and usually it leads everyone to a dead end. I won't say all, but I, I really find that when you become too, and I'm now I'm 77, I think I can say, when you become too invested in these symbols, you have nowhere to go. Because if I tell you that uh, purple is purple and ain't nothing but purple and ain't gonna never change but purple is purple and purple we're gonna die purple because there's no room for dialogue discussion nothing it is dead and I know that because I've seen that happen you know in meetings and lots of things um, I guess Protestants are good for that because uh, as my mother said every time one person gets mad at another person in church they go split off and create their own church and that's true <laughs> you know you just mm -hmm. keep having church at the church at the church at the church um, I will give the Catholics credit but, um, I guess the Pope didn't allow that so they had to just keep on going the way they were going <laughs> so but you know it, it's a it's a major issue for us uh, because we are so open to all people which is great we are open you're, you're free to worship you're free to have your symbols to a point. Uh, and the point is, where is the dialogue for how we get that done? Bobby, Believe the, oh, sorry, it is not in the press. Go right ahead. I think you've hit on something really, really important here on the symbol, symbols being such a vexing problem. Um, Yesterday, for example, and the tragedy here in Orange County of one of the soldiers mm -hmm. who was killed in the in the aftermath there of, of, of Afghanistan. And this may sound harsh to some if they're invested in symbols, but I watch the incredible outpouring of grief 
And we could go on a litany of these examples over the last many years that people pour out into the killings of different people, individuals, and all this. And yet they won't take the time to think of the root causes of why. Like, why in the world are we putting so much emphasis on this young man who got killed in Afghanistan when this huge problem of this war that's gone on for 20 years, what was the cause of that? Who benefited from that? Why did we allow that to go on for 20 yes. years? And now we have this great outpouring of emotion for this one individual. And yet, by some accounts, how many hundreds of thousands or maybe into the millions of, of people have died in Afghanistan? Died. How many millions of people died in Vietnam, the Vietnamese people? Yep. And yet a soldier coming back with a draped flag got all of this attention while millions of people were being murdered and, and no one was focusing on what was the root cause? Why were we there in a war to begin with? Uh, so symbols, I think you hit on something that's so important. People invest in these symbols instead of thinking, what can we change? What are the causes that we can change that would bring us into connection, that would bring us into family so that we would have that public kinship? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I applaud you for uh, speaking out on this. Uh, it's something that we need to bring attention to. And I, I didn't mean to get off on a rant here, but uh, no. <laughs> it's a very important. I'm really anxious to get into your book about what we can do uh, as well. But please go on with symbols. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, I, I was I was finished. I mean, uh, the last one, and these things will be in, in uh, if I ever get this book done, you may never. I thought it was supposed yeah. to be done by the end of September. And, uh, I know. Calendar's correct. That's only a couple I of days. I know. I keep changing because it. the world keeps changing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the big one, of course, is the, uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty. Um, and most people do not know the history of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, we all think we do. And we think that it was uh, erected for um, welcome immigrants to the United States, which is actually not true and was not the reason that it was erected. And of course, there is a story behind it, uh, which may explain why you don't know the full reason. But that statue was given to the US uh, by the French. They probably would come and take it back now, but they, <laughs> they, gave, they, gave it to, they gave it to us because we dared to fight a civil war about freedom of a people. That was why. And there were many people, uh, when even though accepting the gift, did not want to accept it publicly that this was why it was given. So just by happenstance, I think even though they may have asked her, but I can't get that part. I haven't read a book or two on it. The poem was written um, and the statue took on the life of the poem. Give me your part, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, which is interesting, but that's the life of a symbol. It comes in as one thing, it grows, it develops, it changes. Um, and it is as, as true as anything that when orthodoxy enters into the public arena, the first thing they will say, and I use that advisedly, they, truth does not change. Well, folks, truth changes. Truth changes every day. The world was flat, we now say it's round. And the truth changes because there is this interplay between religion and science. One which says it is fact-based, the other which says it is fact and faith-based, but more faith-based than fact-based. In America, we're in that ditch between the two. That is the conundrum of symbols and ideas and truth in American life right now. We probably cannot solve this, but I tell you that is what we have been given and um, we have to live with. Uh, it makes your life really happy some days when you don't always think about it. And then some days it's very vexing to think about. 
you know, what, what you're pointing out about this, about this breach really has to do with one of the concepts that Michael and I've been working and playing with, which is cultivating a sane and sacred community. And uh, that is something uh, you had mentioned it earlier, that, that unifying idea that brings us together regardless of these uh, uh, fundamental different ways of seeing the world. And um, what is it right now that is there anything that can create a, uh, a true sense of unity, not a phony one, but a true sense of unity that goes above and beyond uh, these ideological barriers that are reinforced by the silo that you happen to be in. Mm -hmm. So it's in being intensified, not mitigated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, yeah, I, I, I think I, over the years have come up with some things that I think could, but I'm not sure if we are willing to do it. And again, it's very simple. I think that you have to have something that touches the human heart in order to do it. And uh, uh, even though I love books, um, I'm not sure a book is it, but I think music is it. I think music and possibly dance, but music yeah. is and, and dance seem to be the heartbeat of the world. And people can and do understand it. There's something about music. I mean, if you see a person who can uh, stand still through all kinds of music, well, that's not a human being. That's something that's missing there. I don't know what it is. It's, uh, my first Indian uh, Kawa went to, I was just going crazy. It was so wonderful. It was just, and I was sitting next to a guy and he was just, and I was like, God, what is wrong with him? You know, he, he just wouldn't let his emotions come over him. He, he wasn't prepared. So I'm not saying it is the answer, but I think it is a answer. I think this whole issue of, and it has been, and in our country, I will say particularly among um, um, Jewish composers who have, uh, use various idioms of the American music uh, ethnic canon to the advantage of popular culture, that has worked. And it does work. And I believe it works well. I think it works extremely well. Uh, and I think uh, that that's the classical or popular, the, the classical sense. But um, I think music is, is one of those keys, I really do. And I, I was struggling to think, I think painting or art could become one if we develop a public philosophy about who we want to be. You know, the thing that happened in, in Mexico, even though, you know, all, all these countries, um, I'm leaving something out that's important, and that's technology. All of us are infected by technology and we change our lives and our truths by the stupidity that we, as we, uh, we, we see on television and um, from people who don't know anything uh, and just say anything, uh, just on these 24 hour uh, newscast people. Oh my God, they just, just anything can be said. Uh, um, but in Mexico, the muralist uh, Rivera had a real idea of how to create the cosmic race, he called it, uh, La Raza. And that was through these murals, which painted um, all kinds of Mexicans blended into the Matisse, the, the ideal um, um, Mexican. I won't go into the ideal American because <laughs> that would be too much. But the same thing was done by the popes in getting, they got the best um, sign painters they could find to uh, make Christ and God look Italian or European and everybody ate up and uh, forgot all about the Semitics. That wasn't, they weren't in the posters. So. <laughs> so all over the world, all over the world as they went all over conquering, we all understood that God was what? Very nice white guy. White guy. <laughs> <laughs> a nice Italian guy, actually. 
<laughs> and um, and and it, you know, to me, it's not a grand fault. I don't think it was a grand plan. I just think they were trying to create Christians in in Italy, and he was trying to tell a story to people who probably who, who didn't couldn't read and did not understand. It was in Latin, and so forth, and so on. So the, part, the point is, yeah, I think those are the kinds of things we have to get to: music, art, and 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 and, and blend some things and ideas and concepts together. Enough said. You, you know, the, uh, you reminded me of something. I think it was 2006. Uh, there was a network of spiritual progressives conference in Washington, DC. And a whole oh. group was going to march onto Donald Rumsfeld's home on Calorama Road, right? <laughs> and there, you know, my friend Caroline Casey, who I love, you know, she makes fun of this by saying, what do we want? Better slogans. When do we need them? Now, right? That all of this, these kind of things that are actually people repellent. So uh, I, my idea was, if we got a Dixieland band, yes. and we sang when the saints go marching in, walking up Connecticut Avenue, I guarantee that would have gotten a lot more play, and maybe Donald Rumsfeld would have gotten out of his house, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You got it, you got it. <laughs> they didn't listen to me, but you know. <laughs> They don't listen to me either. So. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. Yeah, it means we're doing something it's right. Very hard to do. <laughs> but I want to get back to something that's very hard to do because I think that this is really one of the one of the core pieces that we want to get to today, and that is that in the thirty years that you've been doing this, um, you know, and looking at the obstacles, how much of this could be chalked up to what they call human nature? How much of it can be chalked up to 10,000 years of living under dominator rule? And, and, and then how much of it can be chalked up to uh, the individual nurturance we do or do not get in our, in our families? Well, I think it, it certainly, um, it, it, it has, I think it is the second one you, you, you mentioned because it is, it is uh, I don't want to necessarily say rule, but we are guided by the supra of the overall um, what, concepts of our society. I mean, we are Americans by virtue of a number of things, um, citizenship, but also by the symbols that are American to us and create, the, you know, uh, American flag, the uh, uh, anthem, so forth and so on. But in homes, people also grow up learning what their group feels about these things, which are their personal and private, you know, it's okay. Um, but one of the things that is so interesting about that is how the family is able to inculcate in the child, uh, not so much, um, I didn't grow up um, um, thinking that if I saluted the flag, I would go to heaven or anything like that. But I did grow up thinking if I did not worship, I would go to hell. Uh, so, you know, it, it, so there are these things that you can't break and the things that you cannot break that you don't think about whether you're breaking it or not. And I think there are in some families, I think they didn't have that. So their unbreakable rule is, oh my God, you can't touch the flag because they came, I guess, out of Europe where they thought that they did not want to go back into a peasantry or into a king or to, and somehow that, even though it's five, six, eight, ten 10 generations away, it is still somehow ingrained. And those who came as new immigrants uh, new immigrants have a almost fanatical uh, sense of that, and anyone who does something to disrespect the flag has done something really uh, un unbreachable. Mm -hmm. um, and see, I don't, oh, I don't get upset about that. You know, if somebody spits on the flag. I guess I should, but I don't because I don't. The flag is a flag. It's what you do with that flag. Have you done good things with that flag? Then all right, I will. You know, have you taken that flag? and you planted it in the middle of some place in America, in Appalachia, and you've done some good up there, really? Because I'm, I'm from Kentucky and I can tell you a lot of good needs to be done there. People have been treated abysmally in that region of the world. Um, 
So it really is a, that's a difficult question you asked, but I think that is the question that my book hinges on. So it is, who am I first? Who am I? Who are they? And who are we? Those are the three big questions. And that's mm. the three big questions I try to answer. And that's what's taking so long because it's a heck of a journey trying to answer three things. Who am I? That's hard. And the, the, the good thing about this, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, you know, some of these ancients were so wise. Um, uh, I forget, what, what was the name of the oracle at Adelphi? Adelphi, yeah. When you went to, when you went to see the oracle, because I had always read it, the, the oracle could tell you, you know, all these great things were going to happen. And, but over the transom of the door entering into the uh, temple, it read, um, know thyself. And so that's the best thing a magician can do. Don't come in here thinking I'm going to give you all the answers. Know yourself. Know thyself. If you know thyself, then whatever I tell you will only help. So that's hard to do. And that's public. And know thyself. And then you might get some answers from that. So I do think that is a, a, a important part of what I'm trying to do. And from there you go to, well, who are these other people outside of my realm? outside of my home, outside of my community, outside of my state, outside of my country, who, and how do you define them? And, and how do you, that's the present world that we live in. How, how can we define the Afghans who we are murdering and they are fighting us, we're fighting them, we were there, we don't know why we were there, but we're there. Um, who are they? Can we answer that question? Do we know how to end with our flag? Can we answer that with respect and we know why we were there? I'm hearing some real strange things coming off of Capitol Hill about why we were there. I don't think the military actually knew, in a sense, from what I can gather, why we were there. 20, how many years? 25, 20 years? 20 years. 20 years. Almost 20 years, yeah. Almost 20 years. Yeah. And then the last question was, well, who are we? Who are we in my family? Who are we in our community, in my state, in my nation, in my world? And I do think the big thing that Americans are going to have to become, and that's going to be hard because we, Americans are going to have to switch to a far more cosmopolitan way of looking at the world. That we, we may love Kentucky and Kansas and Missouri and LA, and we have to keep all those things in mind. But we're in a global world and we function that way. And so you can't have a society half of it functioning one way and another half functioning at another very different level where no one understands what the other one is doing. And that that is just, I think, um, I think that is just uh, a recipe for disaster because I don't think the Trump people understand what we're doing, what we not me, but what the government is doing, or uh, what they understood the plain and simplistic and hateful, uh, I think, language of Trump, but they did not understand the, the political ease of the policy wonkishness of the, you know, of, of a sophisticated class of people who are doing stagecraft for Russia, but that same stagecraft doesn't work in Bowling Green, Kentucky, because it's a different audience. But what television is bringing you is everybody's getting the same strange message. And so they say, well, what are they doing with my money? You know, why are you spending my money over there? Or as you just said, Michael, you spend all that money. So what I get to do is I get to grieve over this one person in 20 years who got killed while serving in this war. You see how confused all that message is and gets and how unless you're thinking about this on a constant, how you get completely fed up and, and you know, and just unable to answer the, the most basic of questions because it's this triple level or double level view of the world as we are world leaders, something the press just loves to say, have we given up our leadership in the world? They don't know what they're talking about, uh, but have we given up our leadership in the world? And then people back in Hoboken, Kentucky are saying, I don't know, I can't buy you know, my groceries this month. Is that leadership in the world? What does that mean? How, do you, how would you conflate those? How, how do you answer those questions? 
Bobby. No, I th yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, you asked three fabulous questions. Who am I? Who are they? And who are we? And I think to answer those questions takes an incredible willingness uh, to seek the truth and uh, have the curiosity to try to seek a continually expanding truth, a holistic like that. perspective. Mm -hmm. You touched on it earlier when you were talking about how truth changes and you made the com comment, if I have it correctly, basically science is fact-based. And you made the example, is it when at some time the people thought the world was flat or a great portion of it did versus around. The, the scientific method is always about curiosity to test and expand. Science has been said that it's it's something finite. It's been interpreted recently. When science, the scientific method is the opposite. It was to constantly push the window through constant uh, experimentation, constant testing, curiosity. And that level of expansion of truth is what we absolutely must reinvigorate so that we can answer all three of those questions to truthfully look at who we are, not just from who we want to be from our ego state, but from who we are as we impact others around us. Um, mm -hmm. Who are they? Until we can get into the totality of their experiences, we can't begin to think how we would act or be if we were mm -hmm. in the totality of their experience. Mm -hmm. And who are we from not just from my perspective, but from a holistic perspective? Uh, and we have to expand our curiosity and willingness to explore the true, the truths so that we can get to answers that we can feel in our hearts, mm -hmm. comfortable with, and mm -hmm. know that the truth that I know today, hopefully I can even learn more about it and, and broaden it always and have that curiosity. So, um, yeah, lovely. I love it. I like, I like, you know, I like that because you make me think of what um, one piece that I'm trying to do now is that um, in, in this little book, even though I say, you know, it's fact based, uh, science, one of the scientists are now saying that, that the universe is ever expanding. It's not sitting still out there, folks. It's getting larger and, larger. and the closer you get to it, the bigger it gets. That to me is such a mystery in my mind. How could that be? And as a little boy, I used to wonder, how could that be? How does nothingness keep? And you see, there are just some things we cannot answer. And if we would just accept that. But I do like the idea of the ever evolving, even though when you say evolution, you look nuts. Uh, the ever evolving uh, <laughs> evolution of this world. And you just said that, Michael, that was what he was, is that this ever evolving world, there's this ever evolving truth. And these, and we have to somehow teach our children, this next generation, how to become a part of that. So we don't destroy what is, and that, that's about. A key yeah. point to that is to not be ashamed of the past, uh, but to learn from it, keep it not in, in its context. Yeah, not to repeat it, but not to be ashamed of it and cower exactly. it uh, is to say, yeah, there were horrific genocide that went on in America as it was being settled and changed, settled, if you will, changed by the Europeans. But we just need to accept it for what it is and say, here's where we are today. How can we accept that know it is it happened and raise our level of consciousness and our openness to each other and say wow you really suffered so have we the europeans who came here their culture had been decimated by people before them earlier on if you go back far enough i mean but now let's come together let's have a a period of reunion and accept that we've all walked a horrific path let's have a time now, of reunion. that is something that i wish we would push because the impression is given in our history books that no such oppression really existed for mm -hmm. Europeans. And that is not true. They suffered horribly. 
Oh, horribly. I, I say often, horribly. I was lucky my ancestors weren't given to the lions. Uh, <laughs> any of them were. Well, I mean, you still have people who don't believe in the Holocaust. I mean, we pe people have suffered horribly, and we simply want uh, the fairy tale. We believe, and this is not true. The American dream is not this fairy tale that people talk about, and I won't get into that right now. But if we could just have that dialogue, if we could convene enough people to have just that dialogue, that could begin something very important, that suffering is not owned by one group. And that, yes, you need to say something about people who have suffered. And I think you need to apologize to those people and you need to do something about that because in this society, it puts them at disadvantage. But the point of having a discussion that is real and not policy oriented about the suffering of people, then, you know, unfortunately we could all cry in our suffering, but at least we have a common stance to begin with, uh, slavery did not begin with um, African Americans, as some people believe. Uh, it just didn't. Well, they do. I mean, I mean, it did not. And um, you know, we take our great narrative from the Bible. Well, those were Jews who were slaves. You know, so it's 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 a very interesting dynamic, but we don't know how to convey it to one another in a sense in this country that makes sense. And we're gonna to have to do that because it is what has gotten us in this ball of confusion that we're in at the present time. Well, when we That's another good song, by the way. <laughs> 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 we could be playing that. <laughs> It'll be playing throughout that entire that song. <laughs> when, when we people moving out, people moving in. <laughs> <laughs> Some people will remember that, other people will go, huh? I definitely remember that. <laughs> I would like to drill in if you could in our in our limited time because I would love we could have this conversation for hours. I've thoroughly enjoyed this opportunity to, to talk with you, Bobby. It's it's wonderful. Thank you. And the work that you've done over the last 30 years, I can't compliment you enough on what you contributed uh, and how many people's lives you've touched along that way that you have no even awareness of. So thank you for what you're doing. But I really want to drill into your the title that you gave us before about your book, What I Can Do to Save My Country, because right. that is such an important question to be asking right now. Right. Could you elaborate on, on it? Sure. Um, I, I did it because um, I, I changed the title 120 times. But this particular one, um, I have now four grandchildren. Um, and I have three boys and a girl. So I have two boys. One is about 13 or 14, and one is about 11. And that was a little, little bit about seven. But um, as they are going through school and studying, um, every now and then they, you, know, they you, you get things from their parents that they're looking at and they're thinking about. And my only thought was, you know, I'm, I'm old, I won't be here long. So I should try and say, First, this is my country. I, I, I have a passport, but I have never tried to go anywhere else to live. Even though I thought about it the last couple when Trump was president, uh, but uh, I didn't. Um, uh, but I said, well, if, if I claim the common culture that I see I believe in, then I must say, all right, these these are the questions. Who am I? Who are they? Who are we? Well, what can I do to say we? And that is not just myself, not just them, but us. What can I do to save us? And that sounds very, it may sound very um, pompous, but it, what, it, what it means is, is taking public kinship to the level of, all right, I'm not going to say what you ought to do. Uh, most, um, I think I'm American enough. I don't like people tell me what to do. And everybody tells me that you really do not like people to tell you what to do. And I say, yeah, that's true. My wife is like, you, I say, well, you know, I grew up like that. So I, I find it um, grating for you to hammer at me as to what I ought to do. And, and I just, there was a politician I could not vote for because his finger kept, I said, no, I don't like people who want to tell me what to do. Uh, but I'll, I love people to tell me, let me reason with you. Let's reason, let's sit down, let's talk, let's dialogue, let's do this. And so that's what this, that book is about. It is about the dialogue in between those three questions 
of what I can do for my country. And in that, I talk about common culture. I talk about race. I talk about music. I talk, these are not just things like dredged up, I'm bringing something my mind. I've been working yeah. on these and thinking about, I, you know, and um, I use examples of people who've taken their great genius. Um, uh, I love uh, Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man. I love things like that. And I'm saying, okay, so suppose we learned how to begin our, um, our, our, our basketball or football. We just got to have music. We have the national anthem. And before we went into that, we did the Fanfare for the Common Man. What would be wrong with that? That is so American. That is so us. Uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing I, I, I try to do. Um, I try to do a little ritual in it because I think we, uh, human beings, we love ritual. We love dance. We, we you know, we, we maybe every so many years we need a national powwow uh, with everybody mm. talking and and listening and not acting like Native Americans or some kind of strange animals, you know what I mean? <laughs> Who really had an idea that we, and this is also very African, but but we, we, we did not grow up that way ourselves. We grew up in America, so because we're, we're mixed. That's another thing I do. I talk about the fact that most African Americans are very mixed. You know, they are not, um, uh, Ghanaians. Ask a Ghanaian, he'll tell you, no, Bobby Austin is not. <laughs> they are not confused. <laughs> we may be confused, but they are not confused. Same thing that, um, you know, once you make it palatable as something fun and interesting, I am doing work, have done the work on country music and how it has to become a key factor in our culture because it is music of the people. It is music that is blended between Africans, African-Americans in the hills and whites and, and Native Americans. So th this blending took place, but the people who keep telling stories, and I don't want to talk about that, didn't tell the full story because they were intent upon it becoming, um, I hate to say this, a whitewash. And you see, when you do that, <laughs> when you tell that lie, it, it eventually catches up with you because it was not that way. It, 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 was, it was blended music. Uh, it, uh, the banjo was certainly uh, uh, blended. It was Africa and then African American. And then it became uh, uh, European because blacks stopped playing it because it was a part of minstrel shows. You know, you have to understand all the different reasons certain things happen. Well, that's, that's what I do in the book when I say, things we can do together. And then I talk a lot about repairing the breach. And I won't go into that because that is long, but repairing the breach is about assuming this common culture and self-leadership. I hope that's not too pedantic. I wanna make one, one, one comment about what you said because mm -hmm. I think it's so very important. First of all, the word that you use, reunion, is a mm -hmm. very, very powerful word. Very powerful word, kinship and reunion mm -hmm. uh, as what needs to happen. Then you mentioned the powwow. And the one thing that's never been tried is a conversation of ordinary people. We have the capabilities technologically to do it. Uh, that is not mitigated by mainstream media yes. because mainstream media is about narratives. Uh, yes. You know, it's, you know, the moment I knew that Trump was going to win in 2016 was when he was in a debate with uh, Hillary and he pointed to Hillary and he says, this is how politicians speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was the understanding that we are being bullshat, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and people are kind of fed up with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and part of the dis dismissal of the East Coast elites who yeah. may have certain answers through their wonkiness is that who do these people think they are? Yeah. Who does Al Gore think he is telling me to not use this when he's got X number of mansions and X number of, of planes? So part of the disconnection is, is our projection of stereotypes on one another. And if yes. we don't encounter those people, all the more easy to put them in that group. So how do we bring people together in this uh, formal and informal common dialogue where we rehumanize each other, where we actually mm -hmm. hear each other's stories, you know, going back perhaps 500 years, to wherever mm -hmm. that came from, we go, my God, we all have the same story. Mm -hmm. um, 
now that we understand that, uh, how do we uh, you know, begin that? How do we have that conversation? Yeah, that's habit. That's me, you, and Michael have that conversation. <laughs> We're having it now. Let's make it bigger, broader, and more uh, inclusive. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea. Uh, something on your homepage for repairing the Breach Institute, mm -hmm. which is Neighborhood Associates, which is, right. is your organization that you mm -hmm. founded, if I know correctly. Uh, yeah. Something you said there I wanted to touch on. Uh, quote, if you don't mind, it is this fundamental breach in perception and consequently in action that the Repairing the Breach Institute seeks to understand and address. Mm -hmm. But to do this, we need new narratives grounded in new approaches and new perspectives. I would like to suggest that one way we can achieve this is to frame the Institute's work in collective voice through the lens of human ecology and public kinship. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that really touched me, and I think that that is so important. And the consequently in action, as you said, there's a there's the group. One of the groups that I, I know you participated in, uh, Listen First, which has a wonderful you know pledge. I will listen mm -hmm. first to understand. And Fine. there's a list of very uh, well known, good intentioned people there. Mm -hmm. uh, that are the leaders, but where's the consequence in the action? And mm -hmm. uh, you've spent 30 plus years working on this. I mean, and there's others that have spent a lifetime that are that have come and gone, that the sacrifices have made. Where is the consequences in the action? And we need to get government. One of the most important things I would like to ask of you and then the group is to focus on a question, how do we get, we must get government on our side. Mm -hmm. It's, we've got all these mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. who say they're gonna listen, but mm -hmm. where's the action? Mm -hmm. The proof is in the action. The words, the symbols, and all of those things are meaningless without the action. And I think it's time that we stand up to our, control, those who control our government today and mm -hmm. say, your actions, no matter what you've said is irrelevant, your actions mm -hmm. have proven that you have not there for the people. You're there for a few, you're there for the special interest, you're there for your own power, glory, mm -hmm. et cetera. We must change that. And to do that, we've got to get government on our side, the side of the people. Mm -hmm. And we've got to break free of the existing two-party paradigm if that's what it's going to take uh, to get out of this and break through with action, no longer words and symbols, but with action. And uh, I so. No, I agree. I could add not one word to that. I absolutely agree with you on that. Absolutely. So we've been here. Uh, Steve, do you have any any final questions of our esteemed guest? I, you know, I have got lots and lots of questions. Uh, we we were we were going to have to continue this because I I really think that there is a kinship here, there is a connection, there's a there's a common idea of perhaps where we where we all need to go together, uh, and in and in convening this. Uh, so perhaps the final uh, question to kind of you know take us out of here is uh, what do you see, Bobby, particularly in, in younger people that mm -hmm. is given, that seems to be a, 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 something that is pointing us in the right direction that goes, ah, you know what? I think we might be able to make it after all. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, that's interesting. We are thinking alike. I wrote a piece um, last year for the International Leadership uh, association. They didn't publish it, but um, they loved it. And it was called The New American Generation. And and I did it because I, I was getting so sick of hearing that newscast he's talking about the greatest American generation, whatever that was. Um, and that's worshiping war, of course. And I just, those are the things that really irritate me. So and you might as well know me a little bit. And there are certain <laughs> things that just irritate the hell out of me. And that is that no one else, the people who keep this country moving are all kinds. It takes all kinds of people to keep a country moving, okay? Not just one type. 
But if you if you watched your television during that period, and mo everyone in the world was, you got to see a new American generation on the streets of this country. And they were everything. Everything that they say, they were there. Uh, some things I can't even say that they say they are. I mean, he, her, she, it, mm -hmm. we, whatever, all purple hair, green hair, pink hair, uh, uh, black, white, uh, Asian, everybody was on the streets fighting for justice and freedom of individuals. That gives me hope. And I don't think they're going to stop. I hope not. I don't think they will. I, I hope they're not living for one demonstration to the next, but I hope that they're putting some things together. But that gave me great hope when I, when I saw that kind of energy take the streets of this country. And it did move this country. It is still moving this country. Um, uh, how long, you know, everything in our country moves quickly um, because we, we, we certainly are a society that consumes things, including news and events. Uh, and murders, and they become almost commonplace. Um, and that was one time. That was the one time I felt. I felt if you can, who can feel sorry for an American president? I don't. But I felt very sorry for Obama the day he looked like he was just going to cry. He said, "If I had to do one more of these, I'm going to pray for you." And these funerals, you know, it's like I don't think prayer is going to get us out of this right now. And I think he was right. He was mm -hmm. fed up. He was like, you know, this is not working. Did anybody actually, they heard him, but I just said, Mike, what was the action? That's what we asked. What, what action did you take, Congress? What, what, the lobbyists told you not to, and so you didn't do it. And so people get tired, they get fed up, and then we get led into the trap of a Trump who's not going to do anything, but who will say that he will, and people will follow that. So I didn't answer your question. I got off, but it, the question, the answer is, I think there is in this younger American generation a more open uh, idea of who they are as they explore themselves in ways that we could never have imagined just 15, 20 years ago uh, that they are now doing. Um, I think that may be, that that's gonna be a fight because they're fighting the orthodoxy that surrounds them is very, 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 um, very, very well entrenched. And so it may be that old people like us become the, the mitigators, the midwives between how this old um, and wonderful and difficult and unkind world dies and a new one is born because that is the struggle, the struggle of a new world and an old world and a new one uh, coming into, um, in, into play. I, I do believe that. Well, unfortunately, that is a place where we'll need to stop today. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Bobby, for being here. I appreciate thank our you. audience. I hope they've enjoyed the conversation and take away from it many kernels uh, from the political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. It's a long journey. Let us go there together.